had jobs for himself. Ghani, which means in Swahili, what's the news? We just come out from celebrating Kwanzaa, and Habaragani is one of the um, uh, greetings that you do, and you respond with the, the uh, principle of today. But since this news, what's the news? The news today is Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program at allpointtv.com. We hope you had a wonderful and joyous Kwanzaa celebration and a great and wonderful, uh, prosperous, wishing you a prosperous, happy new year. Amen. Miss B and I welcome you to a new year 2017. Wow. With us. Amen. I am your host, Catherine Hunter-Williams, and with my co-host, Miss Catherine Blake. Hello, everybody. And as I always have to say, when I say Miss B, I'm talking about Miss Blake. Okay, before we go any further, be sure to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, and not birthday, but day. His birthday is the, uh, the 15th or the 14th? The 15th. Uh, the 15th mm -hmm. of January. But they have a holiday. We have a day that they celebrate, and it's on January 16th. If you have a black flag, which is the uh, red, black, and green, red is for the blood, black is for the people, and the green is for the growth. Or something else. Prosperity. Prosperity. <laughs> Growth. Um, <laughs> hang your flag out. And hang it out all throughout the rest of the month of this month and all during Black History Month. And if you want to go on into Black History, I mean, March, which is, black, we celebrate Black Women History Month. Amen. So, okay, y'all can just, just get that flag and put it out and let it hang if you got one. If not, um, who sells flags here in the city of Flint? Uh, I don't know if anybody does now. Ah. Yeah, not unless uh, Baba Collins has some. Elliot. Elliot McCants. Priest McCants. Yeah, but I have no number for him. I got it in my phone, but mm -hmm. he's, he used to sell them. I don't know if he still do. We need a black store somewhere that we can buy candles. All the stores are Amen. closed. We can't buy candles to for Kwanzaa because the Africa, uh, the, the store that was up on Clio Road, it's done closed. Mm -hmm. You can go get black flags there and African clothing from there. We have nowhere that you can go and buy this stuff. What about that guy, the gentleman that was over on uh, Flushing Road? Is he still around? I don't Had know. Had that emporium? Did, you should. You, got, you had stuff in his store. Oh, oh, him? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. He is, uh, that, that, that's totally different now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is he still there? Yes, he's still there. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh I'm sure it is because they was going away that I said, mm -mm. <laughs> y'all can go ahead on with y'all stuff. <laughs> All right, now let's move on and get it going on, Miss B. 
Today she's going to tell our story about um, Thea Bowman. Thea, uh, the servant of God, Sister Thea Bowman. Amen. And if we have some time, then I'll tell our story about another revolutionist who was like Martin Luther King was a revolutionist, Malcolm X was a revolutionist, mm -hmm. no matter what nobody mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. James Arms Armistead Lafayette, who served as a double agent spy in the American Revolutionary wow. War. Back then? Oh, he was deep. What? Wait till you hear the story. I got a good one on him. I said, wow, how did he, okay. I Double we, agent. I would love to put a movie out on him. Mm-hmm. I got a picture with, well, we'll talk about it. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Let's pass it on. All right. Because <laughs> we got, uh, we got good We time. good, we good. We good. All right, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sister Thea Bauman was born December 29, 1937. She is the first black Catholic nun to join the white Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in the 1960s, and she worked with r issues of racial inequality. Sister Thea Bauman, she has... Uh, a FSPA, which is the Francescan Sisters of Professional Adoration, Ph.D. She was born in a small rural town in Canton, town of Canton in central Mississippi. Her grandfather was a slave, her father was a physician, and her mother was a teacher. And in 1965, Senior Bauman received a BA in English, Speech and Drama at Vertebo College in the La Crosse, Wisconsin. And in 1969, she received a MA in English and in 1972, a PhD in English Language, Literature and Linguistics, both degrees from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Also, her name, her, she was born Bertha Bowman. Okay. Yep. She was, a, and also she was a Roman Catholic religious sister and servant of God, teacher, mm -hmm. a scholar, as you said. And yeah, I'm who, coming to all that. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> she was an awesome woman. Yes, she was. Yeah. Uh, she has been a teacher in the Blessed Sacrament School of La Crosse, Wisconsin, the Holy Child Jesus High School in Canton, Mississippi, the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., the Vertebo College in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and the Institute of Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Ooh. In her position as a consultant for intercultural awareness for the Diocese of Jackson, Mississippi, Sister Thea frequently worked with children to help them grow an awareness of their gifts and their cultural heritage through song, dance, poetry, drama, and story. She communicated joy, freedom, and pride using traditional black teaching techniques that are holistic, participatory, and reality focused. Sister Thea makes more than 100 public appearances each year, giving lectures, recitals, short courses, workshops, conferences, presentations, spreading the message that the people are gifted, that black is beautiful, and that cross-cultural collaboration enriches both education and living. And in Nigeria, Kenya, Canada, and the Virgin Islands, Hawaii, New York to Florida, Mississippi to California, Louisiana to Illinois. Thousands of people have worked with Sister Thea. She makes doers of watchers. She makes people more aware of their own gifts and potentials and put races in touch with one another. Her ministry is a ministry of joy. Sister Thea deservingly received her Doctor of Religion from Boston College in 1989. The following is a citation of speech conferring her distinction in the 1989 Boston College Commencement 
ceremony. And this is what it says. Francescan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, charismatic evangelists calling black Catholics to their rightful place and to the expression of their culture within the church, advocate and consultant for intercultural awareness for the Diocese of Jackson, scholar of English language and literature expert in the Renaissance of the work of William Faulkner, master teacher whose methodology riches the black community traditions in traditional ways of learning and doing, profoundly touches rural Mississippi school children, university students, and worldwide lectures or concert audiences alike. In the glory of your ministry, we witness the Francescan ideal of joy rendered more radiant by a woman of lively, living faith, truly black and authentically Catholic, to your long time, your lifetime of building the kingdom of God, preaching the good news in the language of your people, and reclaiming the virtues and values that are your inheritance. Boston College says an approving amen and proudly declares you, Dr. Thea Bowman, Doctor of Religion. Wow. Wow. Thea I, Bowman. I got some others to add to that. Yes, ma'am. You found out or you want to read it yourself? You can do it. Okay. In his book, Eleven Modern Mystics, Victor M. Perichin, a meditation teacher, notes her impact on Catholic liturgical music. All right. By providing an intellectual, spiritual, historical, and cultural foundation for developing and legitimizing a distinct worship form for black Catholics. She explained, when we understand our history and culture, then we can develop the ritual, the music, and the devotional expression that satisfies us in church. Amen. I like that. <laughs> and then she was also an evangelist, and, and she said this. She appeared on, on the news show, 60 Minutes. I don't know if y'all remember Mike Wallace. Yes, I do. She told Wallace that, I think the difference between me and some people is that I'm content to do my little bit. Sometimes people think they have to do big things in order to make change. But if each one would light a candle, mm. we'd have a tremendous light. Amen. This woman was really, truly something else. And she also did this. She became instrumental in the publication in 1987 of a new Catholic hymnal. Wow. Lead Me, Guide Me, the African-American Catholic hymnal. Whoa. The first such work directed to the black community. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, James P. Likes, Auxiliary Bishop of Cleveland, also a uh, uh, black American, coordinated the Hymnal Project, saying it was born of the need and aspiration of black Catholics. Bowman was act actively involved in helping select him to be included. The Hymnal includes an essay by her titled, The Gift of African American Sacred Songs. Wow, I gotta get that. And, and in it she says, Black Sacred Song is a soulful song. And then she describes these five ways. Y'all gotta go find it out for yourself. It's five <laughs> different ways she described that song. But that the woman is was a, a, she was truly a woman of God and she changed the, she lived to change the, uh, the, uh, uh, black Americans, the black, the Catholic, mm -hmm. the black American Catholics, and and changed the way she dealt. And also, she has a, a don't she have a, a? She's located. They have a the a, a Thea Bowman Community Health Center in Detroit. I didn't know that. Uh, and if y'all would like to check it out or go to it, I got the phone number. It's three one three eight three five five nine nine zero. That's the Thea Bowman Community Health Center in Detroit, Michigan, 313-835. You say health center? Health center, 313-835-5990. Wonderful. Bertha, Bertha Bowman. All right. I don't know where she got the name Thea. 
but <laughs> that's her name. <laughs> they named her sister Thea Bowman, but her birth name is Bertha. Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? I wonder when that, how that, that happened, how they changed her name, or how she changed her name. Or a lot of times when a person joins the religious orders of the Roman Catholic Church, they're actually, they're, they're, their name that they were given as a, a child, childhood is actually is like a given up and they choose like they they choose like a name from a saint or something like that they respect oh. or admire so i mean it might be thea might be one of the, i don't know so there's so many hundreds of maybe thousands of saints in the mm -hmm. catholic you know world so it, but um yeah they usually do that like I, a lot of them i've remember, like uh they'll have like benedict like one of what i liked was that uh, benedict rochelle he used to be on ewtn he was a monk mm -hmm. and then they all but they, a lot of times they'll give up you know benedict usually is not a name that people give their children it's more of an old-fashioned <laughs> name i don't know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well no it's well, actually there's like benedict was like saint benedict in the catholic church is like one of the most uh he, the, the, if you ever see a crucifix got a metal in the back of it it's like a circular metal yeah they that's a Benedictine metal, Benedict medal, and it's supposed to be like a real good um, um, protection against evil spirits and stuff like that. So, oh. so that's where they get it. it, gives it the same with the double cross. Right, you know, right. It has the little smaller one down there. Yeah, that, that's a cross of um, the Orthodox Church house that has that. I forgot the name of it, but I, I think I got one around the house. Yeah, so. But anyway, that's where she might have gotten the name. It was maybe from a saint, because Catholics at the time of Confirmation will take a name of a saint they studied during the time of Catechism and that they appreciated. And oh. they would put that as like, they'll have their middle first name, middle name, and then they also take the saint's name. A lot of times on some documents you'll see a person's name who's Catholic and it's got like three, two, uh, two like middle names and one of them's the name of the saint they have adopted, you know. Oh, well, that's okay. interesting. Yeah. And that's, that's our, our, our producer, uh, John Wilson, who is also a great historian. Amen. And I think a researcher too because John be coming out with some way we get it. We done researched that and found that different information out and it helps us a lot on our program with giving us another point of view because Amen. we didn't have that information. Mm -hmm. Thanks John. All right, let me let's move forward and go to James Armstead Lafayette. I'm really interested in that. Oh he was uh born December tenth, seventeen sixty. And he was a black American slave who served the Continental Army in the American Revolutionary War as a double agent. Can you imagine that? Oh, the story is awesome. I wish I could make a movie about him. He served under the Marquis de la Fayette. Did I pronounce his name? Lafayette. I'm sorry. Yeah, Reporting yeah. on the activities first of Benedict Arnold, which we was talking a little bit about earlier, after he had gone over to the British, and then Lord Corn Cornwallis, during the run-up to the Battle of Yorktown, he also fed false information to them. He also worked with uh, George Washington. After getting the consent of his master, Armistead volunteered in 1781 to join the army under Lafayette. And, um, you know, also he... Well, I'll get to it. I get ahead of myself sometimes. I do this at church and get ahead of myself <laughs> on my other program. Uh, who utilized him as a spy. Posing as a runaway slave, he joined the camp of Brigadier Ger General Benedict Arnold, the turncoat who was leading some British forces in the area. Pretending to be a spy for the British, Armstead, Armistead gained Arnold's confidence to the extent that Arnold used him to guide British troops through local roads. Really? The ex-slave who later renamed himself James Armistead Lafayette, in the general's honor, served as a double agent against the British under the avowedly anti-slavery Lafayette. After Arnold departed north in the spring of 1781, James went to the camp of Lord Charles Cornwallis and repeated his successful pose there. <laughs> he was still playing that spy deal. He moved frequently, frequently between the British camps where the officers would speak openly about their strategies in front of him. Amistad documented his, this information in written reports, which he, would, he then delivered to other American spies. In this way, he relayed such information about the British plans for the troop deployment and about their arms. The intelligence reports from his espionage, that's something. That's truly something. We had a 
uh, 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 <laughs> a slave that became a, a spy, a double agent. The intelligence he he wrote he had intelligent reports from his espionage <laughs> were instrumental in helping to defeat the British during the Battle of Yorktown. Okay. Wow. In 1824, the Marquise de Lafayette returned to the United States at the invitation of President James Monroe and made a tour of all 24 states in which he was met by huge crowds and everyone feted, feted him as a hero. While in Virginia, where he visited Washington's grave and gave a speech to the House delegates, he abruptly had his carriage stopped and when he saw Armistead in the crowd and rushed to embrace him. And around that time, around this time, he also wrote a testimonial on Armistead's behalf. Although Virginia passed a manumission act in 1782 allowing for the freedom of any slave by his or her owner, James Armistead remained the property of William Armistead because <coughs> a 1783 law targeted specifically at freeing slaves whose owners had used them as substitutes. He was used ooh, he was used to go and fight for this guy. Is that what they're saying? Substitutes. Yeah, there's all times where you could, uh, rich people in the past, like in the Civil War, you could pay a person <coughs> to take your place in combat, you know, instead of you serving, you'd pay somebody else to do it. Wow. So he, he he didn't pay him to do it. He sent him to do it. It's very possible. I mean, you, you know, very possible. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Can you drink some water? Uh, I think I got it. It's just way sometime it comes to whatever. It's, it's Michigan. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he, a substitute for army service in exchange for their liberty did not apply to him because he was a spy, not a soldier. Oh. However, in 1786, with the support of William Armistead, then a member of the House of Delegates, and carrying a 1784 testimony of his service from the Marquise de Lafayette, Lafayette James petitioned the Virginia Assembly for his freedom. On January 9, 1787, the Assembly granted the petition at that time he chose to add Lafayette to his name to honor the general. That's today, January 9th. Oh, well, we on time, ain't mm -hmm. it? It's 1787. He 2017. Got his, <laughs> <he got> his, <laughs> hey. Wow. <laughs> Amistad continued to live. And this, that, thank you, Catherine, for bringing that out. I didn't even take that off. So, hey, we on the time. What, this is 1987, take 2017, that's how many years ago? Well, that's a lot of years. Yeah. <laughs> Amistad continued to live in New Kent County with his new wife and one son and several other children. He became a rich farmer and at one point owned three slaves. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. George had, uh, Dr. George Moss had uh, Henry Hatter. You know who Henry Hatter is? Mm -hmm. He was on this program and we was talking about owning slaves. We was, you know, about blacks owning slaves. So I asked him, I said, if you were living back in that time, would you own slaves? And he said, yeah. And so I just did a like a, I guess my eyes did what yours just did. Because <laughs> <laughs> I said, I can't see me owning no slaves. Mm -hmm. If I bought some a, a slave, I would set them free. But he, he, you know, but, he would be the bourgeois of the th at that time. Because that was what home slaves yeah, well, it's, it's, was it's, bourgeois it's, black people status yeah. hunters. Well, see, the thing is, we we have the benefit of looking back, you know, back and say, look what they did, and we wouldn't do that. But you know, in all reality, many people would have. I mean, even though the ones they say like they wouldn't do it, it's just something you fell into. There was no real big animosity. Not animosity. There was no big 
you know, a stigma attached to it. There wasn't a stigma attached to it. I don't know how it could happen in a Christian society, mm -hmm. largely Christian society. I don't know how, but other than again, I don't know how people, how we can have so much warfare is attached to Christianity when the person this is the religions founded upon never advocated for that position. But it was, it, I guess it basically comes down to simple as the humans are humans. And you have a tendency to, if those who you could suppress and oppress, you're going to do it. If you get the chance to steamroll over somebody, you're going to do it. So but the, who knows? The, the slaves, the blacks, back then, who were free, mm -hmm. it was about status. The more slaves you had, the more status you had. That's what that was about back then. Right. And to the white man put him in his place. Mm -hmm. And they made a law. I wrote about it in the newsletter. They put this law, and I can't think of that right now, but they put this law that they had, they took them down. <laughs> they put them in their place. They didn't want them equal to them. Well, see, that's go, yeah, something that we're going to dialogue about, a Nietzschean idea about master and slave moralities, and that's a real good, good that's a real good, it's a real good thing to look at, Nietzsche and uh, the Nietzsche's idea about the master and slave moralities. It's really, um, it's basically what you're talking about right now, you know, basically whatever the master possesses, the, the slave is not going to allow or even want to have possess themselves mm -hmm. because they don't want to resemble too much of their oppressor. So whatever they see in themselves, it might be like their oppressor, they demonize, or now it's no longer bad, but it's now considered quote unquote evil. So anything that's so, it's kind of the transference of like, you know, the changing of the values. You know, what you value is going to be different than the person who's over you because you don't want to be like them. So mm. you, you have a tendency to, you know, then Nietzsche talks about that quite a bit in his master and slave morality stuff. So it's really an interesting so conversation. So can we invite, invite him on the show? <laughs> Nietzsche, he's been got dead since two, uh, 1900. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> By 1818, he applied the state legislature for financial aid. He was granted $60 for present relief and a $40 annual pension for his service in the Revolutionary War. Amistad died on August 9, 1830 in Baltimore, Maryland. There's a picture, uh, uh, John, with uh, him with standing up there with George Washington. Okay, it says, this, this is what this says. It says, through the eyes of whites. And it says, slavery in the eyes of whites was glossed over. Not everyone agreed with slavery. But the one who did made, who did made slavery out to be a pleasant experience. White people would make comments such as, they were fed and sheltered. What more did they want? Wow. And that's, uh, if you, to the, the guy to the... On your right, that's uh, James Amstead Lafayette, and the other guy is George Washington, who was president of the United States at one time. And that was an interesting picture. I mean, I just thought it was kind of cute, cool, mm. you know. And that's our story today of James Amstead Lafayette, who was a um, double agent spy in the American Revolutionary War mm -hmm. and the woman of God, Sister Theo Bowman. Now, I'm surprised they didn't put out something to a hit on him to have him murdered being a spy. <laughs> You know. It was too swift. <laughs> By the way, I, I got a question too. Um, Thea Bowman, is she still with us or did she no, pass No, she what? died. No, she, she gone. Did. Okay. I thought we said to cover that. 1990. Okay, so I, I, maybe you caught that. Maybe you said it on the early March stage. March 30th, 1990. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, she was 52. Yeah, I said it earlier. Okay, sorry, but I just didn't catch it. So oh, okay. I just remember it repeated. Because I, I got, sometimes, you know, I get a call or something coming oh, in here. So, mm -hmm. all right. Oh, you do? Occasionally, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I get people don't, you know, usually um, it's, you know, solicitors and stuff like that and more oh, you know, okay. crook calls like that. <laughs> okay. Let's keep on moving on forward because we got two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Be sure to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s Day and Black History Month is coming up. And our theme song, Be Proud to Be Black, featuring Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, would be a great song to have as your celebration music at home or as an interlude what, before you start a program or whatever. <laughs> you know, it would be great to be playing that and to let the people really listen to it. To receive a CD of Be Proud to Be Black featuring Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, contact TP Productions at 810-962-3258. 
That's 810-962-3258. Be proud to be black. Um, uh, what's going on with political uh, pundit Dr. George Moss comes on every Monday at 2 p.m. And on Tuesday evenings at 8.30 on Channel 17, all the programs, well, some of the programs from allpointstv.com comes on Channel 17 every Tuesday night at 8.30 to 9.30. As always, Miss B and I like to say Asante, which means in Swahili, thank you very, you all very much to, to you who have watched our program today. And we definitely hope that you have been filled with high spirits and knowing that we have a great story. We do have some great stories. Mm -hmm. And we incur I mean, this man was a double agent. And there's much <laughs> more to his story than what I just gave mm -hmm. you a little bit of it. I would love to see a movie about him. Mm -hmm. Of how he played that part of being a double agent. And he worked for the British and he worked for the Americans. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was something. And Sister Bowman. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, the, the things that she done and the, the education that she had mm -hmm. and passed it all on over and Every. made changes in the Catholic for the for black Americans. I mean, mm -hmm. we got a story. That's why I say we encourage you to learn more about Amen. our story. Until next time, as we want you to know and always remember that black Americans are a strong and resilient people and that no one can keep us down. Be proud to be black and always keep on keeping on with us. Hotep, which means peace. peace.